All right, so today we're going to be talking about all things 1031 exchange. We're going to be talking about what we're seeing in the marketplace as far as 1031 exchanges and where we see things maybe possibly going. I love it. And Lane, I know being the stats guy of the team, you have dug deep into this. So let's get started. <laughs> Don't be too sure, but let's, let, <laughs> but let's do it. Uh, Wait, was, was that a segue to just say, I want you to run with this? Yeah, exactly. This is your topic, <laughs> Scott. No, my name is Lane. This is Scott. And we're happy to bring you another episode of uh, Orange County Real Estate Beat. Yes. Okay. And uh, we're going to be talking about 1031 exchanges. So let's start off with this. The Investopedia definition for 1031 exchange. Okay, okay stop right there, Lane. I didn't even know there was something called Investopedia. So you're already no. investing me here. I relied on Investopedia when I was in business school at Chapman University. Anything that I needed to look up as far as business related is on there. It's like, it's the dictionary for all things business. All right, well, I, we'll move on, but you're frightening me because I had a big giant fat Webster's Dictionary on my desk when I was in school. <laughs> so let's not even talk about the age difference. Okay, well, let's talk about what Investopedia has though. So in real estate, a 1031 exchange is a swap of one investment property for another that allows capital gains taxes to be deferred. That seems pretty clear and concise. That's pretty darn straightforward. So basically, the way I look at that is you're just kicking, kicking down the road the can of capital gains. Okay, so what are you? What are we seeing in the marketplace? Are we seeing a lot more 1031 exchange hap exchanges happening? Are they slowing down? Like, like you know, in our list for our listings, right? Yeah. We, we review offers all the time. Are they 1031 exchange offers, or you know, what are you seeing? You know, we're not seeing that so much in our seller marketplace. Most of our clients are past clients and referrals in our sphere. So I think that also kind of sets the tone for who our, our base is. But as we look at the offers coming in, I'm going to say that I'm seeing an increase in buyers that are in the midst of a 1031 tax deferred exchange in the last year. What are you seeing, Lane? You know, I'm seeing the exact same. I, I, I'd say, you know, especially in multiple offer situations, there's, there seems to be at least one that's trying to do a yeah. 1031 exchange. Yeah. I was going to say, and as we preface too, as we are the, at the Sack and Stone team, we're a small SEAL team, but we do have our own clients and our own transactions. We team up on all of them to give the best service, but we do have different insights from those different clients. Now, do, you, do you have any like indication or, or thoughts on maybe why we're seeing you know more 1031 exchanges uh, as far as offers on our listings? I, I've got one thought, and again, this is just boots on the ground, what we're seeing experientially. And I think that sell, and again, also because we have the internet and, and instant, uh, instant information on demand now, these people are seeing the affordability and the rate of return increasing in other parts of the country with relationship to California. Again, we have extremely high rents here, but we all have also have extremely high prices. And we have people that are wanting to move on and um, upgrade their real estate portfolio, but get the highest and best bottom line, which is a combination of what their mortgage payments are going to be if they're leveraged and what the incoming rents are going to be. And of course, in the cost of ownership, I'm going to throw just something out there as a quick example, a fascinating example. I was talking to a lady the other day and she and her um, parents owned a vacation home in Maui. They've had that for five years. They've rented it out. Uh, so it was I'm an sure investment. they've done very well on that. They've done very well. Yeah. They rented it out, but they were also using it as a vacation home for themselves. And they said, you know what? We're kind of done with Hawaii for right now. Her best friend happens to live in Rockford, Illinois, of all places, which is a, a suburb in the middle of the state in Illinois, and um, kind of a college town, I guess. But long and short of it, they sold this property for close to a million dollars, ended up investing in a triplex and a duplex in Rockford, Illinois. And they're looking at cash flow down the line. So that's just an example of really, in my opinion, thinking outside the box, but looking at what the numbers need to be and what's working for them in their lives right now. Sure. And that was a residential to residential Correct. exchange yes. too, right? So what I'm also noticing is I'm noticing a lot of commercial um, investors are parking money from commercial to residential. I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now in the commercial, especially if you own maybe some office buildings. Yeah. Because our our workers starting to come back to work. Are they still working in an office? Or are they working from home? Um, there just seems to be a little bit more of a safety or a little bit more security in residential right now. So we're definitely seeing a lot more commercial exchanges from commercial to residential. I think you're right, Lane. And I guess it's just a flight to residential because one prevailing thing is everyone needs a roof over their head. And with prices going through the roof, continue to appreciate, it's harder for some people to buy. And there is a flight to quality rental properties. Conversely, though, you know, and I guess this is maybe a couple of years old, but we have some clients that had a couple of fourplexes. They decided they were tired of what's called tenants and toilets mm -hmm. and didn't want all the calls in the middle of the night. And they exchanged their two fourplexes for uh, two fast food um, outlets in other parts of the country. Now, that's 
to me, a bit of an anomaly. Uh, and again, that's two years old now, so it might not be quite as topical. But it's fascinating to see people flip-flopping. They get tired of that and think, oh, I'll go to the commercial and have a triple net lease where the tenant pays for everything. And is the grass greener on the other side? I don't think always it is because, again, we have to keep in mind, too, when you go to other parts of the country, you have the forces of Mother Nature at work, just like we have our fires and our um, situations, floods here in California. You've got tornadoes, storms. Sure all these other things in other parts of the country. So it's never, never an absolute you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Now, let me add one more. And, I, and I, this isn't it's fascinating. The, I love talking about this topic. The, this isn't a, a political statement or anything like that because I'm not favoring one party or, the, or okay. the next. But from what we've heard from people that are performing 1031 exchanges is there's a fear that maybe the 1031 exchange program might go away. Yeah. And so they and they know that over the next two years or so that they are most definitely going to be making a move. They're just happening to be making this exchange and this move faster than maybe waiting a year, waiting a two two years down the road. So maybe that's also why we're seeing yeah. a little bit more of an influx of ten thirty one exchanges happening. I think you're absolutely right, Lane. And we've seen that when there is an external force at play or the perception of an external force, such as you know the political climate and the, and the fear that the tax benefits of the exchange may go away, and people are thinking, oh my goodness, I in a perfect world, would be doing this, this, and this a few years down the line. It kind of forces their hand to make that move now. If I can share another story, I met some folks on an open house the other day. Uh, they came in. Uh, it was a condo. They came in and said, hey, we already own one condo in this area. We're thinking of exchanging into another one. We have a duplex we want to sell, and it's up in uh, the Sacramento area. So they would sell that duplex in Sacramento, moved here. And then the next step, which I found fascinating, was it was part of an end game plan to sell those two condos in five years when they retire and exchange those into their forever home in Huntington Harbor, which is a waterfront community that we have here in Southern California. I thought that was fascinating how that strategically was going to play out because, again, they were consistently deferring tax. Then they would turn that last investment into their forever home, and that would be a principal residence, but they would not have paid any capital gains getting there. Yeah, I can see that path happening too. Now, let me ask you a question. If I'm an investor, but I've never sold any of my investment properties before, and I know that I'd probably like to utilize the 1031 exchange, is that process complicated to do? That's a great question. Everyone thinks it's very complicated, but... We have the um, additional addition of what's called an uh, accommodator, which is a neutral party that gets involved in the transaction along with the escrow company when you buy and sell. The property actually transfers briefly into the uh, hands of the accommodator during the process. So a buyer makes a contract to buy a property, and then the accommodator takes over briefly, actually takes possession of the property, then transfer, transfers over to the buyer. Long and the short of it is your question, Lane, it's complicated, but with the add uh, addition of the accommodator, which there is an additional fee, and it's not that horrendous compared to the normal closing costs, it takes the worry and the fear and the risk out of the uh, the seller's hands. Yeah. Okay. Now, if I'm a seller, yeah, I'm not an investor, and an offer comes in that is from somebody who's is like to purchase using a 1031 exchange, are there some things that I need to be worried about? Great question. And the answer is not really because we have a we have a clause that goes into the listings here if you're selling. It says seller to cooperate with 1031 exchange at no expense to the seller. So if you are selling your property, let's say it's your single family home or something, and you have a buyer coming in that's part of an exchange, they do all the work, they pay for everything. There's no no hassle, no money out of pocket for our sellers. That's a great, great question. Mm, absolutely. Now, we love talking about all things, including 1031 exchanges, and we know that there might be a little bit of confusion or a lot of questions surrounding 1031, and we maybe we didn't even answer all of them. But if you do have any questions for us or additional questions that may have popped up, please leave them in the comment section below. We promise we'll get to those answers right away, uh, answer those questions right away, excuse yeah. me. But we love doing these. We're going to come back at it next week. Same time. Yes, sir. Same place in this awesome Absolutely. podcast studio with a brand new topic. And we're always mixing it up. Today was just a fun back and forth just to get the conversation going for those of you thinking you wanted to be on one side or the other of a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Absolutely. We'll see you next week. See ya.